so we see David in lament. We see him in anguish. We see him in sorrow. He doesn't hide it. He doesn't come to church trying to act like, well, everything is fine and I'm blessed. No, he's real. He says, God, if I can't go to you, I can't go to anyone else. I'm going to come to your presence. I'm going to say, God, I'm in the one that's in need of prayer. I'm the one that needs uh, your help. I need you to bless me. So I bring my sorrow. I bring my pain. And he says, I am a sinner. I have failed you. Uh, it's me that has caused you to rebuke. It's me that has caused you to chasten or discipline me. He's not saying I'm not a sinner. He said, I am a sinner. But God, you are gracious. And God, you are loving. Can I preach this to you right now? That as I preach about the sin of David, you better be clear that there's a God of second chances. There's a God of mercies. That when hell tries to keep you out from a place where God's presence is at, don't let anything separate you from the love of God. I don't know. The enemy tries to use shame, but you see God brings conviction, and he'll bring you to an altar, and he'll bring you to a place where you can receive that forgiveness. The mercies of the Lord are brand new every day. I think it's important for me to preach this to you, because if you listen to the, the language, he's speaking with sorrow. He's speaking with hurt. He said, it's me that sinned. It's me that's made the mistake. I'm not going to look at anyone else. I failed you. And you could hear it in the words anguish and sorrow. Can I preach to you right now? It's because in 2022, some people's idea of, of, of repentance is very transactional. Okay, God, you died on, on the cross. I failed. Here, you fix it. That's it. Well, there you go. I went through the motions. But there should be a place inside of us that breaks our heart when we're sinning against our God. There should be something deep inside that says, God, what breaks your heart is breaking my heart. That when I fail you, God, it hurts you and it, it, it bothers you. And so, God, I come before your presence saying, God, wash me and cleanse me. Take this sin away from me, God, because I don't want anything to separate me from your presence. I don't want anything to keep me away from you. God, I bring my sin before you. I know it's awful, and it's, it, 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 it's gross before you. It hurts you. Can I use the word? It's obscene to you. But still, God, I come before you with these broken pieces saying, God, you're the only one that can heal me. You're the only one that can put me back together. I come before you, and I need you. I'm going to preach something. I'm going to do it under the authority of God. Is that sometimes when we go through sickness, we need to start taking some inventory. God, is there sin in my life? Now, understand, this is personal inventory. Not where we're like Job's friends. Well, Job, it's probably because you're a sinner. That's why you're sick. No, that's, it's not our job to try to clean someone else's room when our house is dirty. Can I preach that? But can I, I, I was looking at the scripture and I thought, David said, God, if there's any sin inside of me, my body is sick. Can I go before you so that you can cleanse me, wash me, and forgive me? You know, I was thinking, in 2022, a very postmodern religious way of thinking, we always think, well, even as I preach, you think, Brother Velasquez, come on, it's biological. I'm sick because I just didn't have broccoli, and I'm sick because I had too much sugar. Yeah, but there's some issues with our children, some issues with our relationships, some issues in our body. Could it be that there's something in there, and life and God is trying to get our attention to get to that place? Because in the Bible, the first thing they would do whenever there was sickness, they would wonder, who sinned? Who made a mistake? Because whatever it is, I need to get right with my God. You don't believe me? Jesus was taking a little uh, walk with his disciples, and there was a man that was blind. What's the first thing the disciples said? Jesus, who sinned, his mother or father, for this man to be blind? Why? Because they would think first, what mistake did I make? What did I do? Because I don't want to anything to be in the middle of my relationship with my God. So I'm going to think, where's the source? Is there anything? Have I sinned? Is there a word? Did I offend somebody? Did I fail? Because I need to clean this up. Not because God wants to judge me. No, because God wants to bring me closer to him. And I don't want anything in the way. Can I preach this to you? 
in James chapter 5, you love it. You, you know it. You even call me about it. The Bible says in James 5, uh, James 5, it says, Is any among you sick? Let them call the elders. Let them come anoint your head and pray for you. And then it says, And if there be any sin among them, let them confess so that they will be healed. I'm preaching the word of God right now. I'm telling you as a pastor that loves you, I want you to be healed, I want you to be whole, and I want you to be forgiven. I don't want anything to keep you away from God's presence. Whatever keeps you from coming to church on Sunday, whatever keeps you to, uh, having prayer on Monday, whatever's keeping you to feel that love on Tuesday and making you get depressed on Wednesday, whatever it is, I want you to be so loved. I want you to be so fulfilled. I want you to be so protected by God's hand that his presence walks with you, that you walk on Friday and everybody else is depressed and you should be depressed but you have a smile in your face because you said make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands serve the Lord with gladness somebody say praise the Lord can I preach like this a little bit he's not saying I didn't sin he says I sinned but God when you rebuke me don't rebuke me with wrath he said, I failed, but when you discipline me, discipline me with grace. Aren't you glad you serve a God that loves you? Aren't you glad you serve a God that gives you what you don't deserve? <laughs> he gives you mercy. The Bible says that the woman was caught in adultery and the law said to kill her. And the law said to stone her. But Jesus said, is there any among you that has no sin? I know what the law says. I know what the manual says. But here, Jesus, full of grace and full of mercy, says, I'm going to die for you so that you can live. Woman, I will not condemn you, but go no, and don't sin anymore. Can I preach to somebody right now? God's reaching out to you and saying, I'm trying to give you grace. I'm trying to give you mercy receive it now I told somebody today pray for me this one's going to be a tough one but I got to preach it he says rebuke me not in your anger nor chasten me in your displeasure but he says have mercy on me O Lord for I am weak heal me for my bones are troubled my soul is greatly troubled is it possible here David is saying God I need you to forgive me I have failed you. I know somebody's saying right now, well, Brother Velasquez, maybe we should find out what David did and then we'll figure out the kind of forgiveness he should get. It doesn't work that way. Sin is sin. Big sin or little sin. Somebody, uh, somebody the other day said, I, you know what, you just don't hear too much about sin. I think things are getting better. I said, really? He said, yeah. When I was younger, oh, that's all people talked about sin. But now nobody talks about sin. So I think things are just getting better. Maybe it was, you know, this, this sickness. They were sheltering in place and everyone just got better. I said, it's not that. Things are bad. He said, yeah, well, I don't hear about it. Yes, you do. They just changed the name. Someone messes up, steals. They say it's a momentary lapse of judgment. Doesn't that sound good? There's somebody, I told them, I said, you know what, yeah, I, I realize, I realize, you know, you made a mistake. They said, I didn't make a mistake. I just had mixed emotions about a situation. But you said that. Yeah, but, you know, it was, it was just mixed emotion. Why? Because we're trying to call sin everything else. But it's still sin. And the only answer to sin is a Savior. And our Savior is Jesus Christ. And he's the one that you say, God, don't rebuke me in wrath. Don't discipline me in anger. But God, if you would just touch me and hold me, somebody say praise the Lord. I love you, I promise you. I wish we had tacos so I could eat tacos with you after this. I'll just sing in the choir or something. He says, my bones are heavy and in pain. My soul is troubled. I don't know about you. Y'all in Clovis, y'all are good people. I, I, I just lived in the Bay Area too long. Just pray for them over there. But I've seen people that when there's sin in their life, it's like the heavy hand of God comes on them. Doctors say there's nothing wrong with you. Tests say there's nothing wrong with you. But sickness has come. Why? Because the heavy hand of God. Where your body is feeling broken. 
and your spirit feels depressed. It's the hand of God saying, I love you so much, it's time for us to get some things right. Can I preach this to you today? I've, been in, I've seen situations where doctors have called and they've said, there's nothing wrong with you. Are you sure you didn't do anything wrong to somebody? Why? Because all your tests look good and the person will be sick to their stomach. Could it be that as David said, it was my body, my bones were in trouble, and my soul was in trouble. And then he asked this question. He says, how long? How long? I know we don't like it when our kids ask us, Daddy, Mama, are we there yet? How long? Maybe you're going through something right now, and you're asking how long. You know, how long isn't a bad question. Because if you're asking the, the question how long, that means that you have faith that, God, you're going to do it. But it's going to take some time. God, I believe that you're going to do it. But it's going to happen. You know, it's one thing when you're sick and, you don't, and they tell you, you're going to live like this for the rest of your life. Others say, you know what, just rest, get better, and let's see if there's some progress. It's a difference. And the first thing you say, well, how long? And it has to be our attitude with God. God, this despair, this stress, this pain, how long? Your attitude needs to be, God, you don't work on my timetable, I work on your timetable. And God, you're never early, God, you're never late, but God, you're always on time. And when my soul is in trouble, and when my bones are in pain, God, how long? Because I know that you're there for me, I know that you're there with me, and you're going to love me. I'm going to trust your timing. It's not my time, but it's your time. God, you're going to rescue me. God, you're going to open up the door. You're going to do something in my life. God, Lord, how how long, David will ask. Clovis Church, I feel very, very strong to tell you that if you can look up to God and say, God, I'm going to trust your timing. That maybe my answer might be delayed, but I know better I haven't been denied. Maybe I'm having to live moments with this difficulty, but God, I believe that you're going to get glory and you're going to get honor. If I have to wait another day, I'm still going to praise you. If I have to wait another week, I'm still going to glorify you. If I have to wait another month, I'm still going to trust you. If I wait another year, I'm still going to believe you. I have no other place I can go. Where else can I go but you? You have the words of life. You have the answer. God, how long? But God, no matter how long, I know that you hold my future in your hands. Somebody give God praise. Somebody give God glory. Somebody bless the name of the Lord. How long? Last week I told you that that scripture we read, it said, we wait patiently. Well, today we say, God, how long? I want you to notice when you look at it, it's the, the way it's written, it says, how long, question mark. It was as if David didn't even know how to ask, well, how long do I have to wait? How long do I have to go through? He just stops with how long. And I, I believe that's important because there's moments in your prayer where you're saying, God, I don't even know what to pray for, but how long? I don't even know how you're going to do it, but I believe you can do it. How long? I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know where, but I know that, God, you have all power and you have all authority in your hand. I'm going to trust you. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Verses uh, 6 and 7, that same chapter. I want to read this with you. It says like this. It says, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. I want you to catch something. Something happens from verse 1 and 5. He's talking about he sinned. He offended. He failed. But now in this scripture he says, I'm crying. Well, you're probably crying because you failed. Yes. But I'm also crying because of my foes my enemies. You better know that hell always looks for a foot hold. Hell looks for an inch. You give him an inch and he'll take a mile. 
you give him a day and he'll take your life. How many people have we heard that something that took minutes, they can't get rid of it for years because it's caused trauma to their life. The things that you said was just one night out now has changed the trajectory of your life. And now you're looking for other things. God has been faithful. God has never changed. It's the decisions that we make. And so now he goes from I failed and I sinned to now but what about my foes? And this is a very scary place to be because this is where hell wants you to be, where you're always blaming everybody for your situation. And as long as you're pointing at everybody, you'll never take responsibility for yourself. I'm like, I'm horrible with my kids because my mom and my dad. No, because you're horrible with your kids. I can't be good to my partner. I can't be good to my spouse because of what happened to my parents. Well, God has given you the power. God has given the authority. You have the freedom and will to choose. Stop using that as a crutch, as an excuse. God loves you and he's given you this human will. He can change it. He can move it. Somebody say praise the Lord. But it happens. We always have a reason. There's people in prison on death row saying that they killed and murdered because their babysitter was really cruel to them. That's a crutch. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You are not what the enemy says you are. You are who God says you are. And he who is in Christ is a new creature, and all the old things have passed away, and God has done something brand new. Somebody say praise the Lord. I've learned. I've learned. I always thought that the, one of the, the great words for, for being a Christian was to say yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, but I've also learned that you need to learn how to say no. But they look very spiritual. Yeah, but just because they have a Bible and just because they're a church, the Bible says, uh, just because they said, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean they, they even know me. He says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Can I preach like that? Is that you've got to realize that now David changes hats and he says, okay, yes, I'm the offender. But God, my foes, my enemies are coming and taking advantage of me. And God, they've come to surround me. They've come to talk about me. They've come to put me into this place. And he said, and because of my foes, I'm in tears because of my sin, but I'm also in tears because they're offending me and they want to hurt me. And, you know, it's amazing because it's a balancing act. Because he goes to, I'm sorry to God, get them. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen somebody... They could, they could, uh, I'm thinking about work, but let's, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody that, that was guilty of some kind of a, of a, a crime, and they could have done it, guilty for it, there's evidence, but maybe somehow the evidence was uh, uh, tampered with, and somehow they're off on a technicality, and they make it like, okay, well now I'm off, now I'm going to sue you guys because you had me there. You did the crime. You did the mistake. And that's how it is with us. We failed God. It's us who messed up. It's us who failed. Maybe their sin is a sin that everybody can see, but your sin is inside of your heart that nobody can see. It's still before God, and it still needs God's forgiveness, and it still needs God's love, and it still needs God's protection. Someone say praise the Lord. And I've got good news for you. That the God that's gracious and merciful that uh, was with the woman uh, in adultery is also with the man that doesn't know how to tell the truth. Uh, the, uh, the same Jesus that can go to the Samaritan woman that had six husbands and the seventh isn't hers. But can go to you and say, God, I love you and I care for you and I died for you. Someone say praise the Lord. So he said, I'm crying because my foes have mistreated uh, me. I'm in tears because I'm in misery. They've offended me. My enemies have surrounded me, and they want to cause great confusion. And God, I pray that you would help me. So what does David do? David sinned, and David's uh, uh, been sinned against. What does he do? I want you to look at uh, verse 4 and 5. Psalm 6, verse 4 and 5. I'm having them put them up there because I, I want you to see it. So It says like this. Return, O Lord, 
Deliver my soul. Oh, save me for thy mercy's sake. Next verse. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give you thanks? You know what David says? He says, okay, okay, God. I sinned and they're sinning against me. And all my prayer is about what I did and what they did. And nothing's changing. Talking about failure. Talking about them failing me. I'm talking about pain and I'm talking about how they hurt me. Nothing is changing. But something goes on in David. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. As long as I'm talking about my trouble, nothing changes. As long as I talk about my bones hurting, nothing changes. As long as I talk about my soul being in trouble, nothing changes. Why don't I turn it around and start giving God praise? Why don't I start giving God praise? To the point where he says, God, I'm going to praise you because you're going to deliver me. I'm going to praise you because you've been so good. Jesus, I'm going to put you in the place where I'm going to praise you. He says, you know what? Maybe my enemies are going to kill me or you're going to kill me. I don't know who's going to kill me. But I need to tell you something, uh, God. I need to tell you something. That in Shoal, they can't praise you. In death, they can't worship you. And if you want praise and if you want worship, and I know that's a priority of yours, you can count on me. If you can deliver me from my sin and if you can deliver me from my enemies, you can count on one thing. I might have failed but I'm still going to praise you. I might have messed up but I'm still going to give you glory. I might have been on the bottom but God I'm going to put you on top. I'm going to lift you up. Oh that's powerful. That's powerful. He's saying in Shoal that's the place of death. They don't have the song that I can sing to you God. In the grave, in the grave, they can't praise you the way I can praise you. The, bo the bones in the tomb can't dance before your presence like I dance before your presence. Go ahead. If you want to kill me or if you want to let them kill me, but if you deliver me, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to magnify your name. I'm going to praise your name. I wish somebody would give God a living praise. I wish somebody would give God a living praise. God, if you you take this cancer away I'm still gonna praise you God if you take my enemies away I'll still shout and give you praise I give you glory nothing is gonna separate me from praising you deliver me oh God from this trouble listen the lesson for the offender and the lesson for the offended is this, that when you make yourself the center of your prayer, nothing happens. When you make the enemy the center of your prayer, nothing happens. But when you put Jesus at the center, I forget about myself and I magnify the name of Jesus. Let them say what they want to say. I'm going to praise the name of Jesus. Let them do what they want to do. I'm going to give God glory and I'm going to give God praise. I wish somebody would magnify Jesus. Jesus, you're at the center of my prayer. Jesus, you're at the center of my praise. Jesus, you're at the center of what I'm doing. And God, if I make you first, God, you're going to add everything unto me. I feel God speaking to somebody. He said, I feel stuck in a dark place. Well, because it's been about you. I feel like I'm in a corner because it's been about your, your enemy. But if you make it about Jesus, if you make it about God, something begins to change and something begins to deliver. Someone say praise the Lord. I feel like somebody doesn't believe me. So let me keep preaching. Go to verse 10. How many are receiving God's word today? The enemy wants to keep you guilty and in shame. There's no power there. You give it over to God. The enemy wants you looking at everybody that offended you. I can't go there because they offended me. I can't go there because they offended me. I'm going to tell you this story just to make you laugh as you get a scripture. There's, we were bowling one time and someone dropped a, a bowling ball on one of the uh, uh, person's foot and just about shattered their foot. And so there they were trying to get her uh, to the doctor. And they said, well, we're going to take you to this hospital. She said, I can't go there because I owe money there. They said, okay, well, we'll get you another one. No, I think I owe something there too. 
She couldn't go to the place where she needed help because she owed money everywhere else. And that's how hell wants to get you. He wants to get you where you can't come back to church and you can't come back to the house of the Lord because of people and because of things. But get thee behind me, behind me, Satan. I don't serve you. I serve him. I bless him. You don't own the church. You didn't die for my sins. This is God's church. This is God's church. And I serve my God. Oh, I wait. I feel it. I feel it. So, and so David says, I'm not going to put my attention on my foes or my enemies. I'm not going to put attention on my sin because my God already forgives me. But this is what I do. He says, let all my enemies be ashamed. Let them be vexed and let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Why? Can you imagine the one that started the, the, the psalm by saying, I'm in trouble. Now he's saying, you know what? I went to my God. And my God who will supply all my needs, now he's with me. At the start, I was in trouble. But now you're in trouble. Because anything that's in the presence of the Lord is protected by God. Anything that's in the hands of God is protected by God. Oh, I wish somebody would get on the hands of God. I pray in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. I wish, so, I don't know what excuse you keep using to get away from God. It's not good enough. God is still greater. God is still bigger. God is still better. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I feel the, can somebody lift up your voice and give God praise? Can somebody magnify the, can somebody bless the name of Jesus? I feel it. I feel it. I feel it right now. I might have sinned, but I'm not going to stay a sinner. They might hurt me, but they can't hurt me because God is with me. Did you catch that? That the one that was in trouble now declares to his enemies, you're in trouble. I wish you would tell your sickness, ooh, I told God on you. God's going to get you. I pray you go into your house that feels like there's a lot of pressure. Go walk inside of there and pray for the windows and the doors and say, you got to get out because Jesus is the Lord of this house. Do you see the difference? When it's about you, nothing happens. When it's about them, everything stays the same. But when Jesus is at the center, then he delivers, then he changes, then he heals. I don't know who's been robbing your attention, but make Jesus the center. But there's pain in my body, I can't think of anything else. For the Velasquez, so what do I do? What do I do? You said there's a lesson for the offended and for the offender. What do I do? Well, if you read this, and you can go do homework on it later, but if you read this Psalms eight times, you read it. Maybe your Bible has the word Lord capitalized. And anytime your Bible has the word L-O-R-D capitalized, it's because it actually means the name of God, Yahweh, that tender name, that personal name. If you look at this psalm eight times, the first phrase, it says, Oh Lord, oh Yahweh. And I ask God, God, what do you want me to tell your people today? What do you want me to tell them when their bones are hurting and when their soul is depressed? You know what he told me to tell, told you, to tell you? He said, tell them to call my name. You see, David, he had Yahweh. Big Clovis Church, you have a more tender name. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. When you are in the middle of trouble, call on my name. When you feel all alone, call on my name. Hell is going to try to bring excuses. Hell is going to try to tell you that God is not close. But you know better than hell. God is with you. And God loves you. And today, Clovis Church, is there somebody that is willing to say, I call on my name. You've Googled and you've read every other book. 
You can read Ditchkey, but you need to read Jesus. You can read other things, but you need to know God. You follow everyone else the same, but you need to know God for yourself. Call on his name. But God, I failed. Yes, call on my name. But you don't know what I did. I can never take it back. Call on my name. They're surrounding me. Everybody knows, and they're using it against me. It's all over Facebook, and everywhere I walk around, they say, it's him that messed up. Call on my name. Call on my name. I'm going to embarrass him, but when Daniel was very, very young, my son, I guess I shouldn't just have said your name. I just, just said one of my boys. But when Daniel was very, very young, we were at Disneyland at California Adventure. And there was this area where they had an artist deal. And there was about three different attractions. Uh, this talking uh, fish deal and all this other stuff. Well, I don't know how, but Dan got separated from us. And he was probably about four or five. And he got lost. Very dark. And he started to yell my name. Five years old. Daniel. Judy. Daniel. And Judy. We couldn't find them. We were in a completely other attraction. Forgive us. We have a good amount of kids, so it happens sometimes. But when we finally went like, oh, where's Daniel? We started searching everywhere. It's dark. We're running around. And I'll never forget the lady said, are you Daniel? I thought, boy, this is scary. I said, yes. And she said, are you looking for your son? I said, yeah. Like, wow, she, prophet or something? And she's like, no. She's like, you need to come with me. She's like, so your son's over there, and we're trying to help him, but he doesn't let anyone close. And all he's yelling is, Daniel, Judy, Daniel, Judy. And every time we try to get close, he goes, no, Daniel, Judy. He says, we can't even get close to him because he's waiting for you. they're so wounded in their heart they've gone into a relationship that's not even of God but because they forgot to wait for their father their spiritual father they stopped waiting for Jesus they've allowed this to come in there's some people that have hardened their heart and don't even believe in God anymore because they stopped waiting for their God and they've allowed something else in but that little five year old at Disney said I'm not letting no one else in because the only one I trust is my mama the only one I trust is my daddy and I'm not going to let you in you can say what you want I might feel alone you might be all against me but until my mama until my daddy I wish you'd have that attitude God I'm going to keep calling on your name I'm going to keep calling on your name you might not answer today but I'm going to call on your name you might not answer tomorrow but I'm going to call on your name you might not answer next month but you're gonna, I'm going to call on your name and God I'm going to trust you and I'm going to believe you no matter how how long I have to wait, you're going to answer me. Would you stand at this time? And for those that are willing to call on your name, Psalm 6 says, the Lord heard my prayer and the Lord heard my supplication the Lord hurt my pain I love the Lord because he hears my cry I love the Lord because he hears my pain you know what if you don't have words God knows how to speak tears so just give him tears if you don't have words if you don't have tears God knows how to speak hand gestures just lift up your hands and say God I surrender your God you to call on him. You know when David got powerful? When he said, I gave God my supplication and he heard me. How do you know, David? Because my God is faithful to his promises. My God is faithful to his word. And so my God is great. Enemies, you're in trouble because God is going to work suddenly. God is going to work at a moment. What seemed impossible, God is going to do right now.
a broken heart and you come to this altar and call on the Lord, he'll hear you. Your body and your bones to its core feels pain. Would you come up here? Call on the Lord. If you feel like you're making a mess out of your future, well, if you put your your life in his hands, he will grab you by the hand and lead you and guide you. The creation can't tell the creator how to do things. The creation looks to the creator. Created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Somebody lift up your voice. This altar is open. Would you come? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain. 